Hello, my name is Phil Allen, President and Owner of Grace Engineer Products. Today we're talking about a new concept in electrical safety. This concept improves upon the already proven existing electrically safe work practices of today. So let's understand why permanent electrical safety devices will make your lockout tagouts both safer and more productive. The best analogy that describes this concept comes from the automobile industry. The automobile industry in the late 50s, early 60s began with lap belts and then improved the lap belt with the shoulder belt and then subsequently developed the airbag. The interesting thing is, is that the airbag is dangerous when you do not have your lap belt or shoulder belt on. So the airbag improved upon the existing practices, safety practices of the automobile industry, similar to permanent electrical safety devices. So let's talk about our objectives here. Our objectives first is to show how permanent electrical safety devices meet and exceed NFPA 70E Article 120, the section that talks about creating and establishing an electrically safe work condition. Next, how permanent electrical safety devices simplify the PPE requirements for opening and closures, assuming that you've done a hazard risk analysis on the individual panels. And lastly, how they these devices can be validated as per Article 120 of 70E and that they create a safer and more productive mechanical lockout tagouts. Lastly, we're going to show how permanent electrical safety devices are actually voltage source labels. And so you're going to see how this works too. So our agenda is simple. Permanent electrical safety devices defined, described, validated, applied and the benefits described. So let's first define a permanent electrical safety device. First thing is they are permanently mounted to electrical systems and they reduce the arc flash and shock hazard risks. If they're not going to reduce risks, there's no sense in putting them on your panel. They provide voltage verification without exposure to that voltage, so they keep your people away from live voltage. They are directly connected to the voltage sources within an electrical enclosure. They provide multiple visual state determinations, audio visual indications, and require a physical action by the worker. So they involve the worker in the process. And they label the voltage, all voltage sources wired to permanent electrical safety devices become labels. So let's next describe the first device of a permanent electrical safety device called a voltage indicator. Voltage indicator is a simple little device that wires between all three phases in ground. It's hardwired. It checks L1, L2, L3 and ground simultaneously 24-7, 365 days a year. It likes both AC and DC voltage. It comes all the way rated for class 1 division 2. The interesting thing is, is it's powered by the line voltage. So it's sort of like a smoke detector that could convert smoke into energy and power itself and you wouldn't need batteries or another voltage source. This is handy because it uses the electricity it's trying to sense. It also requires no batteries, long life. It's rated for category three and category four and it uses long life LEDs for 15 to 20 year life. The next device we're talking about is a voltage portal. This is another simple device. It's just simply a little polycarbonate device that mounts on the outside of the panel and it encloses a little voltage wire to your voltage source and presents that voltage source close enough to the outside of the panel so that a standard non-contact voltage detector can sense the voltage in the panel. When you pair these two devices together, we call this our combination unit where we're using both a voltage indicator and a voltage portal together and both simply check each other and offer some degree of redundancy. The next device, which doesn't necessarily meet NFPA 70 Article 120 but can be used in higher voltage applications, is a medium voltage indicator. This device bolts on to your bus, medium voltage or high voltage bus, and it simply kind of couples itself, makes a circuit through ground capacitively or through the air 
to drive enough current through some LEDs to make a flash. So it can be bolted on and adjusted and then the workers can look to see if the bus is live inside by just looking through a window in the panel. So next we're going to talk about validating voltage detectors and this comes from article 120 of 70E and it says before and after each test determine that the voltage detector is operating satisfactorily. So whether you buy a $5.95 little neon voltage tester at the store or a $2,000 fluke meter before and after each test you need to make sure that it's working functioning properly. So in the case of a voltmeter basically you test the voltage detector to a known voltage source, you test your actual source and then you retest your meter to another known source. Well with a voltage indicator this is impractical but with a non-contact voltage detector it's actually practical because the non-contact voltage detector can be tested to a separate source. Current, in order for validation of any voltage detecting device to take place, current must flow between two potentials for the voltage detector circuit to detect voltage. So you must have current flow. So let's understand how these two devices have current flow in them to then validate that they're working, functioning properly. So here's the voltage indicator, and the voltage indicator is wired between all three phases and ground. And when it's functioning properly and you have a nice balanced system, current flows between all three phases and there's very little flow of current to ground. If you blow a fuse, say on L2, then all of a sudden the current flow changes between L1 and L3 and ground. If you lose another phase, or in this case, this would be a failed isolator where the disconnect switch blade welds and the other two are li or the other one is live, then basically you have current flow between L1 and ground. So the point here is no ground, no voltage indications with one phase live. The next point is, is that making sure this thing works right, there's actually six current paths through this device at any one time. So there's six individual possible current paths. Talk a little bit about reliability. It's interesting because this device, the first electrical component that the line voltage hits is a high resistance passive input impedance. This actually gives you quite a bit of high surge immunity so they make them pretty, they, these things last and you know pretty noisy type environments. Um, there's also two LEDs per phase, so you can see here how one LED flashes when the sine wave is high, the next LED flashes when the sine wave is negative. And in order for anything to flash, the current must pass through between two of these voltage detection circuits or four LEDs. And the idea here is if there's anything illuminated on this device there's voltage. So if for some reason you had three LEDs failed and one LED was lit you would know that there's voltage in that panel. And obviously you must have a written procedure to validate the device. So this device isn't anything special. It's not a safety device until it gets wrapped into a procedure. Now let's talk about non-contact voltage detectors and how these devices get validated. These devices are pretty simple. They basically are a capacitive device and they basically set up, there's two capacitance, one between the conductor, insulator, and the non-contact voltage detector, and the next is between the non-contact voltage detector, the man and ground, or the worker and ground. Between the conductor and the non-contact voltage detector is a smaller capacitance. Between the non-contact voltage detector and the worker is a bigger capacitance and under the law of capacitance it basically says your voltage drop if on a smaller capacitance is bigger and there's a bigger bigger the capacitance the smaller the voltage drop so the non-contact pin just checks between these two voltage drops and can determine if there's voltage in the conductor. Unfortunately what happens to make these devices unreliable is there's a phenomenon called 
parasitic capacitance, and parasitic capacitance just means that you're disturbing the normal capacitance with other energized conductors or the devices too close to ground. So that causes these devices to not sense voltage when there's actually voltage present or vice versa. Basically what has to happen with this device is there's basically a, a current flow that's set up between the conductor, the non-contact voltage detector, the worker and ground. And that's basically a completed circuit. It's a very small amount of current, but it actually a little bit of current that flows to there. So let's talk about how this non-contact voltage portal system is validated. In, in this case, the worker comes up and the panel is live, so he puts his non-contact pin into the uh, voltage portal and the, volt, the non-contact pin will beep, indicating that there's voltage there. And that's essentially validated the current flow from the source voltage up to the voltage portal and through the worker and ground. And because, he has, because the voltage portal is permanently installed and the man basically has to sand in the same place, if he knows the panel's live and it's working, he puts the pin in and actually validates the ground path. So when you open that up, open the disconnect up, and you put the pin back in, it indicates that there's no voltage. Now here's the, here's the thing, is when you install voltage portals into a panel, you want to make sure that they're installed close as possible to the source voltage, and that the wires are routed, cleanly routed, away from any other noise that might noise or electrical energy in the panel. So just by the way that we install these, we're reducing the amount of parasitic capacitance within the panel just by design and installation. In other words, here's a motor control center that's got voltage portals installed and here's a rat's nest worth of wires and if you put a non-contact pin in that rat's nest of wires you never know what's going to happen but we're a lot safer by putting the pin into the, into the, the motor control center vol voltage portal on, on the one side here. So how does voltage detection meet and exceed NFPA 70 Article 120? So let's go through the step-by-step -step scenario here. First, Article 1, Step 1 says determine all sources within the panel. So if every source within the panel, like your main three-phase source, and maybe one or two other separate 120 volt sources coming into the panel, have a permanent electrical safety device installed on them, well then obviously you've identified all your sources in the panel so the electrician knows when he comes up to the panel how many sources he has to feed in that panel. The devices need to be adequately rated and this basically is what we call the CAT test, category 3 or category 4, which means that the device can be used in power distribution as well as motor control center circuits. Um, it does need to be, our step five needs to be hardwired to the source. It needs to have a phase to phase and phase to ground check in number five. And it needs to be verified before and after test. So we can verify with the non-contact voltage detector can be verified before and after each test as well as the the voltage indicator which cannot be verified after the test but can be verified before the test. And lastly there's a little note, it's called informational note in NFP, the recent NFPA 70E document means that they need to be certified under UL 61010 which is the standard if you want to build a voltmeter that's the standard, the UL standard you need to meet. So all voltage detecting equipment are, are meet the standard and both the voltage portal as well as the voltage indicator meet the requirements of the standard. So let's talk about a lockout tagout with a voltage indicator. And here is the sample lockout tagout in NFPA 70 and XG. And basically I've taken the liberty of putting a step before called before the lockout tagout and a step after where we want to verify once we reapply the power we want to verify the voltage indicators functioning properly. But everything else here, electrician walks up to the panel, sees the voltage indicator flash, 
and then disconnects the energy, applies his lock, goes through these steps, and the voltage indicator actually babysits. It's sitting there wired throughout his entire lockout tagout procedure, so if he walks away and someone were to, you know, apply the power, or some kind of power shows up in the system, he's the voltage indicator is babysitting him. Versus a voltmeter, it comes out of his pocket at step five. He temporarily does his test and he puts it back in his tool belt and he's off doing his work. So that's the lockout tagout with a voltage indicator. So let's talk about a voltage indicator and a voltmeter comparisons. Uh, the big difference is, is that NFPA 70 Article 120 was basically written for around a voltmeter because that's all that we had back when, the, when it was written. But a voltage indicator's sole purpose in life is detecting voltage. It doesn't do anything else, it just flashes if there's voltage from 40 volts AC or more. It's hardwired to the voltage source, a meter's not. A meter's temporary connection through connectors. A voltage indicator is a permanent device. It doesn't fall out of tool belts. It doesn't get damaged as easily. It not only checks L1 and L2, but it's constantly checking between L1, L2, L3, and ground constantly. With a voltmeter, this is a six-step process. And the device actually detects both AC and DC. So if you have energy that's stored in DC, you know, coming back into the system, you can determine if, if it's dead before you go into the panel. Um, voltmeters have batteries, this device does not. And this device does, in effect, give you a visible blade indication. So basically, if you have a disconnect blade weld, you can see it before you go into the panel. So brief summary, mechanical lockout tagout without voltage exposure um, provides Permanent electrical safety devices provide power, system information, phase loss, blown fuse indication, labels your voltage sources, reduces the PPE when opening the panel. Um, we just want to make sure that we're not ever saying to untrain electrician not to test before touch, but we want the electrician to check. When he checks the, the disconnect or the main source with his meter, that he's making sure that he's checking a dead panel. And, obvious, and then it reduces your arc flash risk because voltage checking is the fourth leading cause of arc flash risk. A couple of resources here. A paper I wrote which expands a lot upon the non-contact voltage detector and voltage portals. Uh, voltage indicator, how it works, it goes into more detail on the type of floating type of power systems, floating deltas, or high resistance ground, how it works, and some of the other little nuances about this device. And a voltage indicator overcurrent protection application note um, regarding we don't recommend fusing them, but there's some jurisdictions that require certain electrical installations, so this, this document addresses all those issues. And then another document called Through Door Voltage Detection Makes Sense, kind of ties a lot of stuff together. So all those four documents are available on our website. So again, we thank you for your time, and find voltage before it finds you. Thank you very much.